Travel Guide, to use a British understatement, I've been severely underemployed. Uh, and now, thank God, uh, my phone is ringing off the hook. And usually when I take groups to Israel, to archaeological sites, I always say to them, how old is the site? How, how does Joe or Jane archaeologist know how old the site is by looking at it? Ah, Ken Zayato. Ken Zayato. Everyone can just put their things onto silence. That'd be great. Um, so people say, well, they can look at the coins. Now, of course, that's not always the case because coins were only introduced by the Greeks uh, in the... Um, by the first coin was meant to have the Owl of Athens on in the fourth century BCE. So any remains from the biblical period, that's the first temple period, anything before 586, would be anachronistic to say they could look at the coins because there's no coins to look at. So Joe or Jane archeologists could date the fight by sight, by different artifacts, but not by coins. Of course, when the second temple period hits, specifically the Persian period, that's when coins start becoming much more relevant to learning about our own history. And the Jewish history is fascinating, fascinating uh, through the study of coins and numismatics. And I'm gonna start off by a very, very small coin because size isn't always what counts. And I hold this coin up to the camera, which I hope you can see because I've got this funny blurry effect. And anyone who's been to Israel will know this is a one shekel coin. I think it's just in focus now. And if you look very closely, you'll see, and we'll see it closer in my presentation, a fleur de lis on it. I'm trying to get in focus, like a little lily, a fleur de lis. And on the side of it, there's a weird squiggle, which is three letters in ancient Hebrew. And that was the first coin minted in Israel. And it was minted during the Persian period uh, from the fifth to the third century BCE. From then on, we have an unbelievable, uh, beautifully illustrated history of the land of Israel through its coins. So without further ado, I'm going to start with a uh, PowerPoint presentation to introduce to some of the coins. And then because of the title of this program is Off the Beaten Track, I'm actually going to take you to three places in Israel which are highly connected to these coins. And I guarantee you that they are off the beaten track means off the beaten track. And some of these places you'll have never heard of, but the coins are going to make the story come alive. So I'm now going to go to a shared screen and hit you with my PowerPoint. Give me one second whilst we work on technical issues here. Uh, coins land of Israel. Here we go. And I'm still with you. One second. Slideshow. Play from start. Okay. All right, let us share screen. One second, share screen here. Ta -da. Amazing technology. Okay, so we are now about to start, play from the start. So the first screen you can see, can you play from start? Okay, can you guys all see a screen that says, Coins of the land of Israel with a coin on it. Can you guys see it? Just give me a thumbs up if you can. Yes, yes. Okay, excellent. So this is where our presentation actually starts. And before we do that, I can't actually see people on the screen, which is very confusing for me. So I just have to see, I'm gonna quick scroll down. Oh, okay, there she is. I'm gonna say hello to my mom. Just checking she was listening in. Now we can really get the talk underway. Okay, so here we go. Let us start. So screen sharing. First coin from Jerusalem. This is that coin that I held up to you just before. Now, it is a hemi oval for those of you who are that interested, but it was issued during the Persian period before 333 BCE. Now, as a history buff, it's always nice when you've got dates that are easy to remember. So, uh, of course, if this was a live audience, I could ask you and all shout out the answer why 333 BCE is so important. And the answer is, that is when Alexander the Great, who, by the way, happened to be left-handed, as most cool people are, um, conquered the Persian Empire. And the we'll get on to Alexander in a second, but for 200 years, the Persians ruled Israel. From about 536, when the Jews were allowed to rebuild the temple, at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, all the way through to 333, when they were in turn conquered by the Greeks 
or with the Macedonians, Alexander the Great's army. And for those 200 years, I always asked my groups whether that was good or bad for the Jews. The only dates we need to remember between 536 and 333, and the answer is no. So no dates to remember is good for the Jews because no news is good news. Usually the dates we need to remember are when bad things happened, like the temple was destroyed in 586, the temple was destroyed in 70, the Spanish expulsion, 1492, the Holocaust. So no dates is good news. And this was issued in a very quiet period of Jewish history. Uh, now, what's amazing about it is, first of all, the symbol itself is a lily, which will come back into play in the land of Israel, ironically, by the great Jew killers known as the Crusaders, who also used lilies on their coins about one and a half thousand years after this. Um, but it was considered to be the symbol of Jerusalem, the fleur de lis, which later became the symbol of the royal family of France. Uh, which is interesting. And there's an eagle over here as well, which has nothing to, obviously to do with the normal association of the Roman Empire. Just simply a bird on a coin is very interesting as a Jewish coin because um, the Bible specifically forbids graven images on, on coins. So how do you know it was Jewish? Because there's little squiggle on the side. I don't know if you guys can see by the bird's beak, by the head, there's a, what looks like a triangle, right? Now, anyone who knows a bit of Greek to you and Greek to me will know the triangle is a Greek letter delta, right? And the Greek alphabet, of course, is very, very uh, popular these days or unpopular. It's to do with the pandemic. And delta is this letter over here. Now, what's interesting about delta, it sounds like dalad, the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which sounds like D in English. And none of that is a coincidence because the Hebrew alphabet for the entire Second Temple period, that's 536, basically all the way through till the destruction of the Temple in 70, was what was utilized for coins, the old Hebrew alphabet. What we call Hebrew today was brought back by the Jews from Babylonia in the 6th century BCE. But before that, we had a different alphabet, the same letters, Aleph, Bed, Gimel, Dalad, but with different forms. So the old form was considered to be more nationalistic, and that was used in all the coins. Now, this is a very small coin. And today, Persian period, 536 to 333. Uh, this is Darius, who, of course, was defeated by Alexander the Great, Darius II. Um, in a few times he was defeated, actually. And this is from a famous mosaic found in Pompeii of Alexander the Great just about to charge Darius, and Darius looking in shock at Alexander the Great. Uh, and this is where this mosaic's from. Now, what's interesting at the bottom, which I just put on now, is a modern one shekel coin I showed you earlier. And for those of you who are observant Jews or just observant human beings, you'll notice it's an exact copy of the early coin here. So the early coin has the fleur de lis. The modern one new Israel shekel coin also has the fleur de lis on. And like all coins in Israel, if you look at the right size, in addition to Hebrew, there's also English and Arabic, which are the official languages of the state of Israel. And the date on the right side is the Hebrew date. Now, what's interesting about the fleur de lis is what's on the left side of it. There are three squiggles. Now it's Hebrew, I'm telling you. And you're saying to me, no, it's not. That's not the Hebrew that we learned when they dragged us kicking and screaming to Cheda. And the truth is, it is Hebrew, but it's that ancient form of Hebrew. The, the delta you can see on the top, that's the Dalad. The middle letter is a He. Um, and the first letter is a Yud. And you might ask what these sign, where these letters come from. And the answer is that they look like picture script. So the initial alphabet was hieroglyphics, where a symbol was a word. And the Phoenicians then later developed a form of writing where a sound was a symbol. And this is the, the root of the ABC or the alphabet we use today. So from this early Hebrew Phoenician alphabet, also known as Proto-Canaanite, uh, Greek developed, and from Greek, the Latin letters that we use developed as well. So this is an early form of Hebrew. It said Yud, He, Dalad which is the word Yahud or Judea, right? And uh, Yahud was the name of the province in the time of the Persians, all the way through the Greek conquest, all the way through the Roman conquest, okay? So it wasn't called Palestine, it was called Judea or Yahud. Next coin, we are on the first royal portrait. Now, 
This coin over here is a pretty interesting coin. It was minted in 305 BCE. It's made out of solid silver. Uh, and that's, it's a big coin. It's one inch or two and a half uh, centimeters. Uh, on it in Greek, next to the bird, it says Vasilius Tolmeos, which means King Ptolemy in Greek. Ptolemy, as we know, was one of the um, diadache or successors of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquered most of the known world from Macedonia all the way up to India before his 32nd birthday. And then he died in mysterious circumstances, either of illness or being poisoned. His surviving son was killed and his empire was divided up amongst his generals. Um, and if you look at this map over here, you can see Alexander the Great's uh, territory and all these different colors when he conquered from Macedonia all the way up to uh, the Indus River in India. And after he died, his um, generals divided up his territory and the richest part of the territory was in purple, went to General Ptolemy. One of Ptolemy's favorite, a famous, famous descendants was Cleopatra VII, the one with the nose, um, who also managed to uh, do a very good job of uh, enticing and romanticizing the most famous people in the Roman Empire, from Julius Caesar to Mark Antony. And Ptolemy had this whole area here, which, as you can see on the map, includes Israel, the land of Israel over here, where it says Gaza and Tyre, which is now in today's Lebanon. Uh, the, gr the green part was the Seleucid Empire that was went to General Seleucus. And as you can see, there's Asia Minor. Israel is in the middle. Now that's always been Israel's problem. It's called in, in real estate language, location, location, location. So unfortunately, Moses turned left and not right, and we missed all the oil. But what he did get is a land bridge with no natural resources, except for the only problem is it's in the way. So any major empire, whether it was the Greeks or the Romans going towards the east, the Persians or the Babylonians going to the west, the Egyptians going towards the south, all had to go through the land of Israel. And it was right in between the Seleucid and Ptolemy Empire. And for 100 years, there was a lot of warring uh, who actually controlled the strip of vital strategic land. For the first more or less 100 years, controlled by the Ptolemies, descendants of Ptolemy, and this is where this coin is from. And then it was taken over by the Seleucids, which gets us to the Hanukkah story, which we're going to approach very soon in our next coin. So let's go over to the next coin. Oh, by the way, one other thing is, notice there's an image on this coin, and uh, two images, an image of the ruler and an image of the bird, as well as the Greek writing. And uh, this is, says Basilios in Greek, and that's Ptolemyos, Ptolemus over here in Greek. And we're going to get back to the image and the fact that this coin is made out of solid silver. Just hold that thought. There's Alexander the Great, in case you're wondering. All right. So let's move on. And by the way, in Israel today, they still mint coins with images on, which is quite interesting. This is a five shekel coin with Levi Eshkol, um, on, who was a prime minister of Israel during the Six Day War. Okay, first Jewish coin from Jerusalem. So the, the picture I just put up over here, my friends, we're now in the period of Hanukkah. I'm gonna take a break after this slide. And I'm gonna show you guys a movie of where this coin was actually uh, associated with. So let's look over here. This is Hebrew letters. And unless you're me, who learned archeology span in Baudelaire University, I doubt any of you, and I'll be very impressed, could actually read it. Um, now, what's interesting about it is even when this was minted, which was during the time of the Maccabees, this is the second century BCE, this, no one else could read this Hebrew either. So don't feel stupid or don't feel left out. Uh, they only use this Hebrew because it's considered to be more authentic or more patriotic. Uh, and it's incredible that the Torah was actually written in this Hebrew and no one can read it today. Now, what's interesting about it is if any of you have seen the animated film, The Prince of Egypt, or something you might have seen, which is the Charlton Heston uh, Moses film, when Charlton Heston or the Moses and the Prince of Egypt holds up the Ten Commandments, it's written in this archaic form of Hebrew, picture, script, or Phoenician, 
or proto-Canaanite it's called, all right? Um, and this is basically the way Hebrew was written for centuries until the Jews were exiled to Babylon, and then they adopted what's called Aramaic square script, which is the Hebrew we have today. And what it says, we're going to we're going to unwrap in a minute, okay? But this was minded by Hasmonean king. The other side of it also has a symbol associated with with Greek and Roman uh, folklore, and this is a konakapia or two of them, which are also known as horns of plenty. In the middle, this funny shape over here, again, if I had a live audience, I'd ask you to guess what it is. It kind of looks a bit like a heart. There's actually a pomegranate, which is one of the fruits associated with the land of Israel. So you have two konokopia, a pomegranate, and a very long Hebrew inscription. And what could it possibly say? So first of all, the date's 130 BCE. That's after the Seleucid army has been defeated by the Ross Maccabee. So this is issued by a Hasmonean king. It's a peruta, which is the lowest denomination of coin. Ten of these are by a loaf of bread. This is like a, one of the equivalents of a, a one penny coin. Uh, and it's made out of bronze, the cheapest metal. It's very small, as you can see. And it says on it in Hebrew, Yohanan, the high priest and council of the Jews. Yohanan. Kohen Gadol, the Chaver Yehudim. That's what it says in Hebrew. So who was Yohanan? None other than the only surviving Hasmonean brother, Yohanan. And the Hasmoneans, as we know, were also priests, and they very modestly made themselves the high priests as well. But it, the word that's missing from this coin is the word king, because the initial Maccabees didn't call themselves king for reasons they didn't want to antagonize the Jews. Why is that? Because according to Jewish tradition, a king can only come from the house of David and be anointed by a prophet of God. And the Maccabees clearly weren't. In America, I'm not sure what it's called in England, but America is called checks and balances. We don't have too much power in, in the hands of one person. You have a judicial system, you have a elected system, you have a, all sorts of three different systems. And in Israel, you had the, the land of Israel, you had the king, the high priest and the prophet. So you had three different divisions of power. Uh, and if you were the king, you couldn't be the high priest in theory, though the Hasmoneans were everything but king in name at this stage. Uh, and there was no prophet. So in all essence, all power was concentrated into one hand. And what they say about power, it corrupts. And what does absolute power do? That's right, it corrupts absolutely. So the Hasmoneans wanted to replace the crazy despotic rule of the Hellenist and Antiochus IV, and you'll see what happens. So this is a coin minted by a Jewish king, written in Old Hebrew. And the amazing thing is about this particular coin, all of us from a very small age know about the Hanukkah story because it is become very popular at the turn of the 20th century because it's close to another holiday. I can't quite remember the name of it, also at the uh, end of December. Uh, and it's become very, very popular. But it was a very minor Jewish holiday until the 20th century. One of the reasons Hanukkah became popular is because it's close to that other holiday. And the other reason is because it is um, was taken on by the Zionists as a holiday symbolizing nationalism as well. So in other words, what is Hanukkah actually about the real miracle? I'm not going to tell you it's about the oil because that was made up by the rabbis about 600 years later. But the actual miracle was what we say in the prayers of Al-Hanisim was the few against the many. A small guerrilla army defeating an incredibly organized Seleucid army. And today, people look at the IDF and say, look, it's a small army against the entire Arab world. That's always been the traditional narrative. Although since the Abraham Accords, if any of you have been looking at the recent news, to see a prime minister of the state of Israel with a kippah on his head, uh, visiting Arab countries the last two weeks, we've seen two visits, one to Bahrain yesterday by Prime Minister Bennett, and one last week to Dubai by the defense minister. We'll see the times are changing, as they say. But the traditional narrative is the idea for the modern uh, Maccabees, and therefore uh, it's an incredible thing that not only is it not about just men in skirts and oily food, you can actually see coins from the time of the Maccabees. So we're going to pause here in this presentation, and I'll hope Dima is on the line, and we're going to go and visit 
a building associated with the Maccabees, and then more about this coin and another Maccabean coin. Uh, so we're not uh, to which video now. would you like me to, uh, if you can okay. stop your sharing? Can and to say, okay, and I will share mine. Just if you can tell me which video would you like me to open. Okay, Ashlishi, Achawon. Just a moment, please. Okay, so folks, we're now going to go to the land of Israel, to the city of Mordein, where the Maccabees were actually from, to a synagogue from the time yeah. of the Maccabees, and we're going to look at two coins that were minted by the Maccabean kings. Uh, Tuvia, are we talking about in those days and these days? Yes, correct. Okay, but just a moment. Okay, okay, okay. you will tell me where when to stop it. It's fine. Just one little moment, please. Okay, great. So let's travel to the land of Israel, to the city of Mordein. And any questions you can put on the chat. We'll deal with them at the end. Okay, folks, on the subject of symbolism, it doesn't get much more symbolic than this. What you can see over here is a menorah, but not just any old menorah, a very special menorah sitting on the stones of this synagogue from the time of the Hanukkah story itself, the Maccabees. This menorah, as you can see, is made out of cartridge cases, which I collected during my IDF service. And uh, it so happened we were in the middle of the desert, it was Hanukkah, no one had a menorah because we were doing maneuvers, and basically, uh, someone had brought the candles, but there was no menorah. So I went around after a live fire exercise, collected the cartridge shells, and made an, a menorah out of it. And what the symbolism there, the big prayer we say on Hanukkah is called Al Hanisim, about the miracles. And one of the lines is, Bayamim Ahem Bazman Hazer, in those days and in these days. In those days, Jews rose up to defend Judaism and the Jewish homeland. And in these days, we have the IDF, the modern Maccabees, who defend our homeland and our values and keep Zionism and Judaism alive for Jews in the Jewish homeland. This memorial, even though it's an ancient symbol, is made up of the symbols of the modern Maccabees. And right next to it, in front of it, we have an oil lamp from the time of the Hanukkah story as well. It's in lamps like this. This is a Hellenistic oil lamp from 2,100 years ago with the original soot over here. And 2,000 years ago, this is the way lamps would have looked it would have been lit by olive oil uh, in the temple and in everyone's houses. Finally, one of the big symbols of Hanukkah is Hanukkah gelt, which means money in Yiddish. What I have over here is actual Hanukkah gelt. These two small coins over here were minted by none other than Alexander Yanai, Alexander Yaneus. Now his Hebrew name was Yohanan. And on one side of this coin here, this is a 2,100 year old coin minted between the years 103 and 76 BCE. And you can see over here, there's an anchor, a picture of an anchor, because they also had a, a, a trading kingdom. And some letters here, it looks like Greek to you, or Greek to me, because it is Greek. And what it says over here is Ale Basilius Alexander, King Alexander. And on the other side, there's a picture of a star, a wheel of a star. And it has on it in Hebrew, in ancient Hebrew script, Melech Yonatan, King Jonathan, that was his Hebrew name, and you can see the ancient Hebrew Mem over there. Now this coin caused a huge amount of controversy, because he called himself King, and according to the religious Jews, only God's prophet could anoint a king, and until Alexander Yonus, no one had called themselves King. It caused so much trouble, he had to mint another coin, and the second coin he minted has on it two Cornucopia, horns of plenty over here. On the other side, in ancient Hebrew, there's an inscription that says, Yochanan, his Hebrew name, Chaver Mordset Yodin, a friend of the Jewish council. And the second coin does not mention anything to do with being a king. So it's pretty amazing how coins uh, have a historical value. And also, you can feel an energy to know that the great grandson of Matityahu, of Matithias, the the, from Mordein, where we're sitting right now, minted these coins. So this is the real Hanukkah girl. This guy's great-grandfather actually revolted against the Seleucid Greeks. That is so cool.
And this thing over here is a black olive all around. Okay, uh, Siamno, one of the olive trees that were 2,000 years ago. Major source of income. Olives were very useful for many things. For oil lamps, for soap, for cooking, for kindling. There was no end use of olives. And guess what? The greatest superpower of the day, Egypt, did not have indigenous olive trees. So Judea used to import a Zima. lot of it, olive oil to Egypt and all throughout the Roman Empire, in fact. So there was a massive industry of olive pressing, which led to the wealth of Judea. And it was very simple, the process. They would get a little olive. Zima. They would Shall have said. leave these stones over here. And then they would be tied to an animal. They would just literally walk around and the stone would crush uh, the olives. If you remember in the book of Judges, the story of Samson, who after he was blinded, was tied to one of these stones and walked around in circles as well. So it gives you a visual of what, what his, what, how terrible his fate was. And this is just the first stage. Once the olives were crushed, they would then take the crushed olives and put them in baskets and go for a second pressing as well, which is the second stage. What we can see here is the first stage, which A, would produce olive oil, but mainly the crushed olives and the pits we then put in baskets for a further uh, process of pressing. In those days and in these days is what we read in Hanukkah. Next week we'll be reading in our prayers. And we are literally sitting in the ruins of a Hasmonean or Maccabean fortress. We are taught in the book of Proverbs, Mishlei, Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam, that the candle of God is the soul of man. For 2,000 years, even in exile, the darkness of exile, the Jews had a hope, a tikvah, and today, we celebrate Hanukkah, that hope has become a reality. After 2,000 years in the darkness of exile, the Jewish people, led by our youth, who revived our language, who revived our land, who defend our land, brought us back by Amim Ahem, Azman Hazem. Chag Sameer. Chag Sameer. Zima. Hello. Yeah, sure. Are we back? Are we back to me, everyone. Okay. Hi. Can you can you just give me a thumbs up because if you can hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can okay. back to you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to the screen sharing somehow. Hold on. Um, and I want to go back to our presentation before we go to our next video chat. Um, share screen. Okay, back to where we were. Okay, first Jewish coin, play from current slide. Okay, good. Screen sharing. Okay, so now we saw that coin in its context. We're going to skip to first a bilingual Jewish coin. So this was done by the last. Uh, major Hasmian king. His name was Alexander Yanaios. And on one side where the anchor is, he wrote uh, Basilius Alexandrios, which means King Alexander. And here's your interesting trivia fact, kids. Uh, Alexander, the, the Jews have got good memories for people who are good to them. It's quite a short list, by the way. That's probably why I remember all the names. Um, and um, <laughs> If you're familiar with the old Jewish joke about the guy that goes to heaven and says, is it, he says to God, is it true with the chosen people? And God goes, yes, my son. He said, well, can you choose someone else for a change? So it seems to be when you're Jewish, everyone's, everyone's being picking on you for all sorts of different reasons, all sorts of different kinds of people. But the people who are good to us, we remember. So Alexander the Great, one of the things that made him great for the Jews is he never destroyed the temple and left the Jews alone. And one of the reasons why practically, because they just weren't worth conquering. I mean, we didn't really have any gold or jewels or diamonds, as long as we gave him free passage through our land to get to Egypt, and he was happy. And um, of course, it's a Jewish legend that he had a vision of the high priest and, and all sorts of things, but the, he was probably a bit more pragmatic. But because Jews were so grateful, every Jewish boy uh, who was born in the year Alexander the Great, went through Judea and didn't conquer it or destroy the temple, that year every Jewish boy was called Alexander. So I would not have liked to be the teacher in the school when he asked Alexander to put his hand up uh, because everyone was called Alexander. 
but to this day, it's the only non-Jewish name which you can, it's, which is classified as Jewish by the rabbis. In other words, you can get a called up to the Torah, you can have it as, on your wedding contract, because uh, we have very big, deep gratitude for people who are kind to the Jews. So he puts over here King Alexander. On the other side, he wrote his Hebrew name is Yochanan HaMelech. Um, again, Hasmonean. And one of the questions, I just had to sneak peek at some of the questions, is could you use these coins uh, in other countries? In other words, were they accepted international trade to use like a Jewish coin from Judea? Could you pop over to Phoenicia and use it, et cetera, et cetera? So you'll notice today that uh, the answer is yes, in a nutshell, is the British currency is called the pound. And one of the reasons why, because originally it was based on a weight, like a pound of silver. If you look in the Bible, you'll see, you'll see that um, Abraham uh, bought the Cape Machpelah for 30 pieces of silver, right? Or the famous story of Judas Iscariot, 30 pieces of silver. But it wasn't um, shekels. It's 30 shekels of silver. It wasn't a shekel like we have today. A shekel was a weight, like a pound was a weight. So as long as the coin was made of the right material and had the right weight, you could use them internationally, as we're about to see when we get to silver. And plus, if you look at this map of the Hasmonean Kingdom, if they were still around today, we would have such a Middle East problem because the, the, Alex, the Hasmonean Kingdom, they expanded so much, it, it included parts of what's today Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, all part of the Hasmonean Kingdom, which is quite interesting. All right. Let's flip over to the next coin, which is a tax coin. Right, now I remember when, um, if any of you studied uh, your English history, you'll know there was something called the Peasant Revolt. Um, and one of the things that caused the Peasant Revolt was the, um, not related to Margaret Thatcher's period, but the desire to collect a poll tax. Uh, and of course, no one wanted to pay it. Everyone pretended they were dead. And then they came and aggressively tried to collect it and started molesting people. And that's, of course, a great peasant revolt in England in the 14th century. But I digress. Um, and then Margaret Thatcher's tax, which was called a poll tax, was also quite unpopular for the same reason. OK, so the English didn't invent poll taxes. It was the Jews. So you can there, you can, there, there you go. You can blame the Jews for that one. And there's a Jewish tradition the, every Jew who went to the temple had to pay a shekel coin, a half shekel coin. Uh, and that goes all the way back to the time of the Bible, by the way. There's, in fact, a, a, there's a reading in the Pentateuch in the Torah, which is called Parashat Shkalim, where everyone gave their half shekel. Now, here's what's interesting. The picture you see at the bottom is the second temple in all of its glory. And the Jews back then paid a poll tax, a half shekel. Now, look at this coin over here on the left. Do you think it's a very Jewish coin? No, it's not. It's got a graven image on and a bird and Greek letters, right? This is a shekel minted, a half shekel minted in Tyre, which is the Phoenician town to the north of uh, Judea, which today is in Lebanon, the city of Tyre in Lebanon. And clearly there's lots of pagan imagery here, but why was it accepted as a half shekel that you could actually use to pay your tax to the temple? And this is gonna uh, make you cringe a bit, but I'll give you the answer anyway. Because it had an it was known in the ancient world as having the highest silver content. So when it came to uh, high silver content, principles went out of the window and pagan image, pagan image, we don't care. It's got a high silver content, we'll take it. So even though it's full of packed with idolatrous symbols, this coin was legitimate tender to pay your half shekel tax to the temple treasury, which happened to be a very wealthy repository of coinage interesting trivia. Here's a modern half shekel today in Israel, and that is not worth as much as a silver Tyronean half shekel, FYI. Okay, first silver Jewish coin. Now this is a beauty. Uh, I'm a bit of a coin collector myself, and um, I would give my eye teeth to one of these coins. This is a coin minted uh, during the Roman period, but specifically during the, what was known as the Great Revolt against Rome. In the year 66, the revolting Jews had had enough of the Romans, and they broke out in the first Great Jewish Revolt. Hameret HaGadol, it's called in Hebrew. Jews were the only people who not revolted against the Roman Empire once or twice, but three different times. And the revolt in Israel, the Great Revolt of the Bar Kokhba Revolt, were marked by issues of 
propaganda coinage. Beautiful coins, beautifully designed, but each one with a message of exactly what they were voting for and why they were revolting. And symbols are very, very important here. So here we have a solid silver um, shekel uh, from the silver coins in the temple treasury. It was melted and deliberately designed. And it says on this side in ancient Hebrew, shekel, that's a shin, kuf, lamed, Yisrael, yud, shin, resh, aleph, lamed, a shekel of Israel. This letter here is the ancient Hebrew shin, and this is the ancient Hebrew letter Bet. And this stands for Shana Bet, or the second year. So this was issued in the year 68 CE, or AD, according to the Christian cal calendar. If you, if you follow Jesus as your Lord, then it'll be Anno Domini. But the um, academic way of pronouncing these years is CE, or the Common Era. And this was issued, and this over here is not the Holy Grail, but it is a chalice that was used in the temple, or a, a cup. And the theory is this was a cup the Levites used to wash the hands of the priests, and therefore was a symbol of the temple. On the other side is what they were revolting for, what they wanted. This is a Yud, Reish, Vav, Shin, Lamed, Yud, Mem, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, Hey, Kuf, Dalad, Shin, Hey, Hakadosha. We are revolting because we want our Jerusalem to be holy. We don't want it to be defined by the Romans, defiled by the Romans. We don't have crucifixions everywhere. Then if you've seen the life of Brian, crucifixion left, crucifixion left. Um, so we don't want any of those. And we don't want the Romans destroying our monetary system by overtaxation. We don't want the Romans uh, insulting our customs. We don't want to be oppressed by the Romans. We want a holy Jerusalem controlled by ourselves. So we are revolting because we want a holy Jerusalem. And our symbol we're going to put on here is a pomegranate, which is, again, one of the symbols of the land of Israel, one of the seven species of Israel. Now, aesthetically, it's a beautiful coin. I can tell you as an artist, and I'm not just a tall guy. I also do art as well. If you go on my website, www.tovyabook.com, you see, in addition to all my tours in Israel, the Jewish art that I do, and one of the golden laws of art is less is more and more is less. It's also a golden law of public speaking, by the way. Um, and these coins are not ungepatch, as they say in Yiddish. They're simple, they're beautiful, they're elegant. And this is a beautiful example of a revolt coin. Okay? And we'll go, we'll go to a film in a second, but first of all, let's see the next coin. And by the way, quite often in modern Israel, uh, they would get coins, would be copies of the ancient coins to show our connection between the Jews who lived in the land then and the Jews who live in the land now. So here, this pomegranate symbol was a, also used in an early Tenagorod coin uh, in Israel back in the 1960s and 70s, if any remember those coins. And it was a copy of the uh, re famous revolt coin, okay? Silver revolt coin. Now, Actually, before we go to Judea Capta, let's go back to our revolt coin and look at it again. I can go back. Take in this coin. This is a silver shekel. Now, if you remember before, I said the lowest denomination of the coinage was called a peruta, which is made out of bronze, and 10 of those are by a loaf of bread. We're now going to go back to Dima, and we're going to see a peruta in the place where it was actually found in the ancient settlement of Qumran. Now, any of you scholars who are listening in will also know Qumran is where the Essene sect live, who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the archaeologists who were excavating, looking for more scrolls, found an entire jar full of coins, because they had what we call a collective lifestyle, kind of an early version of a kibbutz, where they pooled their resources. And clearly the Roman army descended on them so fast on their way to Masada that no one had time to take the coins. And... Um, almost 2,000 years later, they found a pile of coins, including a revolt coin. So let's go over to Qumran on the shores of the Dead Sea and check out the next coin. Dima. Yes, Tovi, just disconnect your, uh, your share screen and I will put the, the Qumran movie. The Qumran, Ken. Okay. Just one moment, please. And anyone who has any questions, please put them on the chat and we'll deal with them at the end.
לא שומעים. It says on it in ancient Hebrew, Shanat Shtayim, and there's a picture of a look, what looks like a, a uh, little cup over here. And this was a cup, it's very similar to what the Levites washed the hands of the priests with in the temple. And the year two is referring to is the second year of the great revolt against the Roman um, oppressors. That broke out in the year 66 CE. So this coin was meant in 68, two years before the temple fell. And it is a bronze puta. Ten of these were by a loaf of bread. And this was the coin used at the time. So what were the Jews fighting for? Let's look at the other side of the coin. And these coins were also used as propaganda. They're written with their old Hebrew. They were fighting for this. And this is what the coin very emotionally says. It says over here in ancient Hebrew, Chet Resh Tap Cherut Tzadik Yud Vav Nun Cherut Tzion. They were fighting for the freedom of Zion. The freedom to practice their own religion and be in charge of their own destiny in their own country. And these coins lay buried in the ground for 2,000 years until they were discovered by representatives of the new Jewish people, um, almost as if they've been waiting for them to be reclaimed. Because now we have the hope of 2,000 years in the words of the Torah's national anthem, Lihot and Choshivad Seni, to be a free people in our land. Wow. Okay. Hi guys. Okay, I'm going back to the screen share right now. And by the way, I can see that a lot of you are writing uh, your questions in the chat section, which is the right thing to do, because uh, we're going to I'm do running through a couple more slides, and we'll do one more short film clip, and then we'll take the question. Any questions you have or comments, you can write in the chat section, and I will address them <coughs> after the last couple of slides, which are coming up right now. I'm back to the share screen now, and we are back to. Uh, there are restaurants that are closing place. Schools are closed. Gyms are closed. A lot of a lot of public places are actually closed. So there's not. A and again, if you could put your silence on. It's okay. To Thank you. Okay, Roimit, a Judea captor coin, Asha. Can you guys see? It says Judea captor coin. Can you put your thumb yes, up if you can. Yes. No. Can't we see it? We see it. Okay. So we can... okay, so we're doing this chronologically. So when the Romans destroyed um, the temple and later Masada after seven years of war, they were not amused. So the, the Roman Emperor Vespasian, Imperiato Caesar Vespasianus, as you can see over here, minted a coin. And the coin said on it very simply, and you don't have to be a great Latin scholar to understand it, Judea captured. Judea has been captured. And on the coin was a palm tree in the middle, which was the symbol of uh, the land of Israel itself, the palm tree. And on the left side of the coin was a Roman soldier standing proud. On the right side of the coin is a Jewish woman representing the Jewish people weeping, almost like... Um, the uh, the what it, the, the the Jewish Bible says Al Narod Bavel Shami Hashem Nubachinu by the rivers of Babylon we sat down and we wept and this symbolizes the total Roman oppression of the Jewish people and Judea captured means Judea has been captured and SC means approved by the Senate so this was a very strong coin it was issued in seventy one after the temple was destroyed it was a low denomination kind of like the equivalent of Peruta. And it was, by the way, it was issued for decades after the destruction of the temple, um, this particular coin. Now, what's my next coin? So what are the revolting Jews' response to the Roman conquering of Israel? 60 years later, those revolting Jews revolted again. This time it was called the Bar Kokhba revolt from 132 to 135 or 6. 
And they also minted coins. So coins really do tell stories. Now, what's interesting about this coin here is if, if you look very closely at the right hand coin, you can see what it was once the outline of a head. So this is called in the, the coin lingo, an overstamped coin. The Jews had taken silver Roman coins, maybe even a Judaic captor coin with the Roman Caesar's head on it. They'd flattened it out and minted another coin on top. And this coin here on the left side is a facade of the second temple. And you can see over here uh, a picture, a computer recreation of that second temple facade. And it says in ancient Hebrew, Shin Mem Ayin Nun, Shimon, or Simon. On the right, uh, there is what's uh, called a lulav and an etrog from the, from the Jewish festival of Sukkot. Um, and it says on here, Lamad Ched Resh Vav Taf, Lechevut, for the freedom. Um, over here, Yerushalayim, the freedom of Jerusalem. So six years after the Romans destroyed the temple, those Jews went and revolted again, minted more revolt coins. The Jews are the only ones who minted revolt coins. And this particular coin has a picture of the facade of the temple, which might have been drawn by the artist based on an eyewitness account. Because there was people who were alive then, six years later, who probably remembered what, this, what Herod's temple looked like, gave a description to the coin artist, and he did this uh, picture, he or she did this picture of the coin. So it's quite amazing. This is probably the most accurate depiction we have of the second temple was from this Bar Kokhba coin minted six years after its destruction. So again, it's a beautiful coin and symbolically overstamped on a Roman coin with Jewish symbols of freedom, all right? And uh, again, uh, modern Israeli coinage, they copy them. Here's the palm tree, which is also a copy of a Bar Kokhba coin. Finally, and this is the point I'm going to show you here that we're going to do with our last video before we go over to the questions. Here's our Judaic captor coin. And symbols are very important. This is the symbol the Romans had destroyed Judea. This was mint in the year 71 CE. In 1958, that is 10 years after the creation of the state of Israel, the Jews also minted a coin, and their coin was an answer to the Roman coin. This is with a break of 1,900 years in the middle. And what was the coin the Jews minted? Let's take a look. Now, as they say in school, if you did a compare and contrast essay, you see there are some things that are similar and some things that are different. So let's have a look at this coin and then we're gonna do our last little clip where we see the coin on location. So same palm tree in the middle, this is 1958, Tash Yach, this is the Hebrew for 1958. And on it, instead of Judea Capta, it says also in Latin, Israel Liberata. Again, you don't need to be a great Latin scholar to figure out that means that Israel has been liberated. The slight 1,900 year gap in the middle. And in Hebrew, it says at the bottom, Asur, which means a decade for the word Eser, 10. Lecherut Yisrael, a decade of the freedom of Israel. Now in the middle, we have a palm tree, again, like the Roman palm tree symbolizing the land of Israel. But where is the Roman soldier? He's vanished, just like the Romans, right? Dust and ashes. In his place is this weeping Jewish woman who's now standing up holding a baby in the air to symbolize the rebirth of Jewish people in their land. And her husband, who's very well trained, is down on his knees over here. And he is planting a sapling to show the rebirth of the land of Israel. And she's holding a baby to the return of the Jewish people to the land. It's a beautifully symbolic coin. The Judea Liberata, sorry, the Judea Captor next to the Israel Liberata. And now the best word of any speech, and to conclude, uh, we're gonna finish off this presentation by showing you this coin on location, overlooking the last independent fortress of the Jewish people back then, overlooking Masada from the mountain next to Masada, holding up the coin and talking about just how important um, the coins were to telling the Jewish story. Once the last clip is over, I'm going to read through the questions in the comment section so you can add 
questions onto the comment section. Okay, over to Dima for our last clip. Yes, stop sharing. Thank you. I will Thank share you. mine. Ben Shmuel and myself are standing here today on the ruins of a Roman army camp. And here we are with our tefillin and talit about to praise the God of Israel. In the year 73 CE, if you would have tapped a Roman soldier on his shoulder and said, by the way, in 2000 years time, there'll be two Jewish tour guides praying to the God of Israel in an independent Jewish state on the ruins of your camp, they would have reacted with scorn and derision and maybe even tickled you in your neck with their sword. They would have said, fools, how can that be? We're the Roman Empire. We rule the world. We are just about to snuff out the last Jewish independence. And yet here we are, 2,000 years later. Where are we and where are the Romans? I happen to have on me over here a coin, a very unusual coin. This coin was minted, this is a copy of the coin minted by the Romans after the fall of Judea in the year 70 CE. And it shows on it a palm tree symbolizing Judea, a Roman soldier standing victorious to the right, and to the left a weeping Jewish woman. And it comes from the psalm, Al Naharot Babel Sham Yeshavnu Vubachinu. Are the rivers of Babylon, we sat and we wept. And it says, even if you don't have to be a great Latin scholar to understand the script, Judea captor. Judea has been captured. And when the Romans minted this coin, they also built an arch of triumph in Rome called the Arch of Titus, showing them carrying the spoils of war of Judea into Rome. 1,900 years later, the Jews returned. And they also minted a coin. And their coin, let me flip around, shows the same palm tree for the Jewish land of Israel, for Judea, for the land of Israel. But the Roman soldier has vanished, as the Romans have, into the dust and ashes of history. And in his place is that same woman who no longer sits weeping, but stands proudly and tall, holding a baby into the air to symbolize the rebirth of the Jewish people. And in place of the weeping woman, her husband kneels in the land of Israel, planting a new sapling, symbolizing the rebirth of the people in the land. And underneath, two words in Latin, Israel liberata. Israel has been liberated. Amen. Amazing. Wow. Goosebumps, brothers and sisters. Goosebumps. Okay, siamlo. Okay, folks. So... Okay. Um, that is it. At the end of the day, I'd like to also thank my friend Shmuel Chantal, who will record all these amazing videos um, with me together on the sites. Uh, if any of you want to see more of the videos, you can go to his website, which is The Running Tour Guide, and check out more videos, or my YouTube channel called Tovia Book, and you can see lots of... Um, Lots of uh, more videos of beautiful sites in Israel. Okay, so I'm gonna, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go and uh, go through the questions on the chat section. So if any of you have any questions to add, now is the time to do it. And I'm going to start relating to what's written here to conclude our presentation. So the first one is, hope to you, despite your busy schedule going forward, you can continue with these fascinating virtual tours. Uh, yes, we are planning a, a schedule of at least one a month. However, the best way to get an experience is to actually have the experience. Now that Israel's open, that four hour flight is highly recommended. And if you do make it to the Holy Land, I can definitely recommend a good tour guide for you. Uh, you're looking at him right now. Um, so you can't replace the experience. Next one, since when is Arabic the official language in Israel? It's news to me, says Sam Sagar. This is a very controversial point. 
Until the end of the previous government's tenure, Arabic was an official language in Israel. If you look all the stamps of Arabic on, the street signs of Arabic on, the, the coins and, uh, and paper and metal coins have Arabic on, the government documents had it on. And then something was passed, a law was passed um, called the nation state law, which demoted the status of Arabic to a important language, but not an official language. And it was a highly controversial because some Arabic speakers in Israel, notably the Druze community, which are extremely patriotic and Zionist, and Zionists and um, they are the only non-Jews who are conscripted to the IDF, uh, Arabic is their mother language, and they took it as an affront. They were kind of demoted in status. So right now with the current government, there are moves to try and, um, uh, should we say, undo the nation state law and restore Arabic to be an official uh, language of the uh, state of Israel. But right now it has kind of like a second class status, which is quite controversial as a preferred language. All right. Um, uh, and Hebrew is not the only official language someone wrote. I'm also Israeli. And uh, when I was in university in Israel, I wrote all of my papers in English. And by law, if you write in English or Arabic, they have to be graded as those are considered languages you can write your papers in. So there we go. Uh, here's someone else. Michael Levine. Paleo Hebrew alphabet was in use from around 1000 BC to the Bar Kokhba Rebellion when it was last used in coins. It's also using God's name with the two skulls. Okay, so about the use of the Hebrew alphabet. Till 586, only the ancient Hebrew alphabet or Paleo Hebrew was in use. After 586, uh, the Jews came back from Babylon and took quite a few things with them, including the month names, Nisan, Iyar, Sivan, Tammuz, Avelul, all those are Babylonian month names. They, there are different names in Hebrew, like, for example, the month of Iyar in Hebrew is called Chodesh Ziv, for example. Uh, they also took with names like Mordechai is a definitely a Babylonian name, Maduk Chai, and Esther is also a Babylonian name. They also took with the alphabet. The only time Paleo Hebrew was used in the entire Second Temple period was for two things. One, it was used for coins, as we've seen. And the other was when the Dead Sea Scrolls are written, the oldest one is from 200 BCE. Uh, God's name, yud Hey vav Hey, was written in the Old Hebrew because that was considered to be more authentic. Uh, otherwise, there's very, very little use of Paleo Hebrew, except for propaganda reasons on coins, and as God's name in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, okay, uh, where else could people trade? We read that. Um, okay, and here's another interesting observation, which is also true by Margaret Ben Natan. Um, there is a version of Paleo Hebrew not used by what. Well, are recognized as uh, Jews today, but there's a subsect of Judaism called the Samaritans. Some of you might be familiar with the fact with the with the parable of the Good Samaritan in the New Testament, who are extremely small, not quite extinct, but very, very on the brink of extinction. They have a, they have two small communities. One is in near next to what's called Shechem or Nabulus, which I visited when I was on reserve duty. And they have a very small community also in Cholon, which is just uh, south of uh, Tel Aviv. And those Samaritans are breakaway sect of Judaism. And believe it or not, their holy scroll, they still is written in paleo, a form of paleo Hebrew. It's not quite exactly the same as the paleo Hebrew, but it's remarkably similar. So they are a small sect, just a few hundred people that still use this alphabet in their holy scrolls, correct. Michael Levine. If the Torah was written around 1350, how could it be written in the Hebrew we know today? It wasn't, is the answer. Uh, the ancient Torah and any inscription from the first temple period is written in the ancient Paleo-Hebrew. So for example, the seals of the royal kings like Hezekiah or the, or the, Dave, or the House of David inscription were all in Paleo-Hebrew, not in Aramaic square Hebrew, because that would have been anachronistic. So any biblical archaeological find is written in the ancient Hebrew, not in the modern Hebrew that we use today, which was only used after 586 BCE. This should be publicized now. Okay, thank you. 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 Th
Okay, so uh, I think that we've done with all the questions. And uh, unless has anyone wants to quickly type another question in. Uh, so what I would like to do is I'd like to recommend um, uh, a visit yourselves because you cannot replace an experience to the land of Israel. And if you do come to Israel, uh, there's a particular museum called the Land of Israel Museum um, that is um, in Tel Aviv, right next to University of Tel Aviv campus. It's next to the Palmach Museum in North Tel Aviv. And in the Land of Israel Museum, which in Hebrew is called Museum Eretz Yisrael, there's an entire numismatics pavilion, which anyone who's interested in coins will find this fascinating. It literally does I, just, I took a few coins from that collection, but anyone who's in Israel can visit it and see the entire history of the region uh, in coins in the land of Israel Museum in Tel Aviv. So I'd like to thank you for your time. I apologize for being slightly late. Uh, I look forward to meeting you guys all again next month. Ciao. Thank you so much. Shalom. It's a pleasure. Very much. Some of us think that instead of, uh, Thank you very much, Tuvia. And uh, see you next time. As we promised, we will try to bring Tuvia at least one of month. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank, you. Thank you. Have a good night. Sure. Uh,